Thanks. Well, welcome everybody. This is Julie Colgan uh, with Epic, and welcome to our final session in our Auto Classification 101 uh, session. So this is uh, Epic and Valora together. So I also have Sandy Sturkey, the CEO of Valora, on the line with me. Today we are going to be talking less about auto classification in terms of its practical application today and more about where does all of this uh, put us for looking into the future. So exciting stuff, um, maybe a little scary stuff too. So Sandy, do we want to um, introduce ourselves? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Serkis, and welcome back to everybody who's hopefully come for the fourth session in a row. We applaud you guys, and thank you for your support. Um, as Julie said, I'm the president and CEO of Valora. We have a strategic partnership with Epic, and Julie and I have been touring the country on auto classification, most recently in LA, and we hope you guys will see us at ILTA in August. Great. Thanks, Sandy. And yeah, quickly, um, so I'm Julie Colgan. I'm a certified records manager and certified information governance professional. I'm the senior director of strategy and innovation at Epic, um, past president of ARM International, and uh, been around the space a long time. So um, I see some names I recognize and some new, some new names as well. So welcome to those uh, I know and welcome to those folks who are my new friends. Um, so I want to flip to the next slide, Sandy. I'll just kind of quickly touch on some housekeeping items. Um, as you mentioned, this is the fourth in our series and the final in our series. Um, so for those who were, have not been able to catch all of them, all of them are available for your viewing pleasure. Um, we will provide at the end of this session a follow-up email to you all registrants with links to each of these sessions as well as um, some other information. So uh, keep an eye out for that and um, all of the slides will be available to you as well. So. Um, maybe just to give a little bit more context for this session. So the first session in the series was really talking about the basics of what the heck is auto classification and why should I even care about it, um, kind of setting the stage for, you know, where organizations are today, what kinds of data challenges exist, what use cases there are for auto classification, and then taking that into uh, the second session, which talked a bit of, uh, more about how does auto classification actually work, um, how does it take a big pile of you don't know what it is and turn it into something that you know something about so you can start to make some decisions about it. And then the third session was, all right, now that you know what you have and you've made some decisions about what it is you need to do with it, whether it's keep it, secure it, delete it, whatever, how can we use auto classification technologies to automate that process and, um, you know, take the scale issues of human eyeballs on decision making to a world where technology can start to make those decisions for us and we can start to deal with the piles of things that are sitting around. And so uh, that was kind of the, the where we are today. And um, so Sandy and I wanted to wrap up this, this series with thinking about where does this take us? What does the future of, of the information economy look like? And where, where does uh, something like auto classification fit into that? So we kind of chopped this up into four sections. Uh, data, data accumulation and management realities. Um, you know, where are we today and what is that looking like into the future? Uh, we'll touch on the new buzzword in the space, content services, very exciting. Um, think about that in terms of where information governance has in the future and then everybody's favorite topic these days is artificial intelligence. Um, and so we'll wrap it up there. Uh, what is the next slide, Sandy? Okay, so um, kind of diving in, um, right where Julie said, we're, we're going to kind of talk about, we're, we're going to take us from today forward. Um, and one of the big um, issues that, that we hear about a lot of times from clients is, you know, what, what is really happening with data? How fast is it accumulating? What are the kind of data management realities? And so um, I at least am trying to coin this phrase here called data under management, which is something I borrowed to, from some friends and classmates that are asset managers or hedge fund managers. 
that are basically um, kind of viewing their world as a portfolio. And that is really what's starting to happen with enterprise content management, that there is data at every point in the food chain from th things coming in as emails or transactions with clients or suppliers, and then existing for their useful life, and then on into some sort of disposition as records or legal hold or rot. Um, and so you have this notion, some people call it life cycle management, um, but the, the point of data under management is that you can then treat it like a portfolio. So you can measure and track what you have, you can look at the rates at which things are arriving, at which things are departing, and you can do, again, with tools like auto classification and predictive analytics, there's pretty much no reason not to know exactly what you have and where it exists and how it's changing over time. So if you put that portfolio mentality, you know, kind of in your head, then ultimately this becomes uh, essentially a question of data maturity. Um, and I'm going to let Julie speak to that because that's really her point down there. Yeah, so uh, this is a topic that um, a former colleague of mine, Brian Simler, and I talked about many times over the years, is thinking about information as an asset. And so we use that phrase all the time, information assets, this or that. But if we think about that really in terms of like an actuarial science perspective, it, it's putting the, the context or the, the idea of asset into the context of measurement uh, in terms of risk and cost. So um, as organizations start to get a handle on the information that they have and that they generate, that they receive, and recognize that there is, you know, huge potential upside around using that information and huge potential downside around the storage and risk associated with that information, it, it, it then starts to put an organization into a standpoint of, okay, if I can understand those aspects and those contours of the data that we have, I can start to make some informed decisions about what I want to do about it. Uh, how much investment do I want to make, for example, around capturing the upside of the information that we have in our organization in new ways to generate new business models, new revenue streams, et cetera, um, or how much risk or cost am I willing to accept? And it's a, it's a question, uh, it's a business question, right? Um, if you think about like Arma's um, generally accepted record keeping uh, principles in the maturity model. Um, no one's ever going to pay to be a level five maturity across every aspect of their business because it costs too much. Um, but in order to get down to making informed decisions, it, it requires the things you're talking about here. We have to know about our data, like specific things about our data, how fast it grows, what it means to us, um, how expensive it is to store it, what potential use cases there are for it. Once we can get there, we can start to make those decisions and really extract the value out of out of those assets. Oops, there we go. Um, so just like portfolios aren't built overnight, um, a lot of times the, the question that comes up is, you know, where do I begin? Or there's just so much data, you know, what's, what's the best starting point? So um, we wanted to raise this notion of data in flight, and that is data that is in some sort of transition. Either it's about a transitory topic like correspondence or some sort of business transaction, or it is resulting from essentially organizations in flux. So you have you know, a merger or acquisition activity or divestiture activity. Um, you have systems of record or archives or backup systems that are end of lifing. So whenever you have this notion of we're either inheriting data or we're getting rid of data in en masse. Uh, another great example for those of you who are at law firms out there, you have laterals coming in. It's a perfect example of data in flight. So the idea is that that's a very good starting point to perform analysis and to essentially bring it into that portfolio because you want to kind of catch it before it lands so that you can run all those analyses, you can have all that rich metadata, you can create a disposition before the data lands in its next resting point. So that's what we mean about data in flight. Um, Julie has a slightly different take on that, so I'd like you to hear her take as well. Yeah, so um, you know, I don't disagree with any of that 
really, but um, the, the phrase data in flight um, has been used in my world, in my sphere over the years to think more about data at rest. So um, data that's been created and is just sitting somewhere on a system rather than data that is being transported somewhere, whether it's a communication or um, maybe in relation to these, these business activities as you talk about. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting maybe point of maturity for the application of broader governance to data in flight. You know, historically, it's been more around security, DLP kinds of things, but now we're talking about applying all of the auto classification goodness uh, and different questions about the data um, while it's in flight, not just is there a security risk here, but, you know, what is this data and where should it be? How do I classify? What rules should apply to it? I think it's all really positive. And we also wanted to kind of um, bring everyone's attention to this notion of data sources. Historically, in an enterprise, the, the data comes from either the employees or clients or suppliers. Um, but in one way or another, it's, it's coming from essentially human uh, creation. And that is something that's starting to change. Um, we're going to talk a bit, little bit later about IoT, Internet of Things. Um, and what exactly is content and who or what is generating that? Um, we are just on the cusp of what we would call post-human content generation. Um, not exactly to imply that the humans are no longer needed, although maybe there's a hint of that, um, but that data is coming from myriad sources now and at a faster rate and depth than we've ever had before. Julie, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, actually, if you'll flip to the next slide, um, I think it's a good one to talk through. So uh, this um, comes from an IDC uh, white paper, um, and it's looking at this, for those of you familiar with their uh, digital universe study that they did with EMC for many years, they stopped doing that, I think, in 2014, um, and they picked it up uh, sort of in, in, this, in this paper, I've got all the, the sources at the bottom if you want to go take a look yourself. Um, but this is an interesting one for me because uh, the IOC actually is something that keeps me up at night, scares the heck out of me. I'll talk more about that later. Um, but just thinking about the data, where does it come from, what does it look like, what do we need to be thinking about, particularly around our organizations as they start to um, understand the potential of information, uh, upside potential of information as assets to the organization and exploring new avenues for that information to either generate it, capture it, or make some new use for it. Um, looking at the data growth in that, from that light is really important. And so this is an updated uh, digital universe sizing graphic. Um, interestingly, the last one that they did with EMC stopped at 2020, where they predicted that we would have 44 zettabytes worth of data in the digital universe. This one actually carries that forward. Um, into 2025 at 180 zettabytes, that's 180 trillion gigabytes. Um, that's, qu that's quite a lot, right? So up uh, from 10 zettabytes in 2015 to 44 in 2020 and 180, 180 in uh, 2025. Another uh, interesting thing to look at on this graphic is that um, it's now starting to measure and you'll see the growth uh, exponentially explode the um, analysis value of IoT data growing as time goes by. Um, so we're starting to generate that now. We've got smartwatches and sensors on everything, and, and that data is there, but not all of it um, is high quality in terms of, of being actionable uh, post-analysis. So um, that's going to continue to grow, grow as well. Um, on the side, in those little circles, I don't know if you can see it on the slide or not, but uh, they try to size the, the growth. Um, so it's saying here on the bottom that traditional data um, will grow by 2.3x. So that's the stuff that we're used to in our organization. Um, the, uh, the volume of data that can be analyzed will, be, will grow by 4.8x. Um, so that's stuff that we can analyze and, and make useful. And then the actionable data is going to grow by 96 so that, that assumes that the, the volume growth that we're seeing is, has a corresponding growth with uh, the actionableness, if that's a word, of the data. Um, another quick thing, just to scare people, if you're not already scared about the IOC and all these toasters talking to the internet, 
Um, today, we have about um, 20 billion devices connected to the internet. They're expecting 30 billion in 2020 and about 80 billion in 2025. Um, IDC also expects that there will be 152,200 new connected devices every minute. Um, and they say that they think everything we have of value will be connected to the internet at some point in the future. Um, and maybe that's true, Alice. My last bit about, about the IoT and uh, the reason I am harping on it is because it's not going away. And the reason it's not going away is because there's a lot of money involved. Um, the current state of IoT in the U.S. is about $230 billion, um, being invested in IoT, growing to about uh, $370 billion, you know, now, next year, the year after, um, lots of organizations are investing in uh, understanding how IoT may make a difference for them. GE is a famous one around the power of 1%, uh, using sensors and whatnot on their, um, their fleets and uh, other machinery to capture even a 1% increase um, or improvement in, in productivity or um, quality will have exponential upside benefit for them. Um, so the focus so far has been uh, on a lot of manufacturing and fleet management and smart buildings, but we're going to start to see that uh, expand out as well. I'll stop there harping on the IoT. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just to kind of make it a little bit more to what people might be used to, um, we found this fabulous graphic, maybe some of you have seen this, and what happens in an internet minute. Um, and it is all different types of forms of content, some more B2B, some more B2C. Um, but what was really super fascinating was looking at a 2018 internet minute versus a 2017 internet minute and how much changed in just a single year. So I'll just point out some that were just sort of fascinating in their growth. Um, obviously, we're sitting around watching a lot more Netflix. Um, and for maybe a younger generation, I know my daughter is all over Instagram, um, you know, nearly a 300% increase. But even good old email, still increasing 20%. That's year to year. Um, that has a direct effect on probably every single person on this webinar because this is accumulating as enterprise content. Instagram may, may not be depending on your organization, but email for sure. So this is, you know, literally the current state of events. Julie showed us where we're going, and I thought it would be helpful to just look back one year and say, wow, that's right. So again, all of this is sort of publicly available information. Um, we will be sending this to you at the end. So, um, you know, you don't have to take a whole lot of notes. So we're going to shift now into content services. Um, Julie, maybe you want to kind of talk about, um, it's your fabulous quote there. So I'll let you speak to it. Yeah, so um, this is my new phrase, pragmatism is the new black. Uh, and I'm so excited about it personally because I think that's where we've been missing the mark in, around information management and information governance over the last several years. We've been trying to be perfect at it, and in fact, nobody's asking us to be perfect. And so we're starting to adopt a more pragmatic approach, which I think is, is ultimately the right thing to be doing. Um, I think content services is, is a reflection of that, um, and not to give too much, too much air time to IDC, but... Um, they have a, a great concept that really resonates with me and I think is, is something useful to draw out here to talk about why ECM is dead, although Sandy will tell us whether or not it really is. Um, no, don't go there yet. Go back. Go back. Oh, back. no. Go back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that was just my hint. Um, but, uh, but why we're talking about content services and not talking about ECM anymore. So um, IDC has this, this concept called um, the third platform. Um, so they, they kind of uh, look at the evolution of computing in three platforms, at least three so far. So the first one was before 1980, where uh, data was basically in huge purpose-built data centers that, you know, only a few people had access to. Um, and then the second platform is from 1980-ish until about 2000, when that was the PC revolution, you know, kind of democratized the distribution of data and computing power. Um, and that's really where ECA, ECM came from, um, as people started to gain power around access to generation of data, they needed some way to store it and manage it and collaborate and share and all that kind of good stuff. So that's where ECM systems came from. Um, 
But then the third platform, uh, which is IDC claims is 2002 today, I'm not sure I agree with that timing, but it's fine. Um, really based on the proliferation of wireless broadband and fast networks um, that allowed us to decouple from the on-premise model. Um, adoption of cloud, adoption of um, internet-enabled devices, <laughs> data centers becoming um, cloud-based hubs instead of, you know, kind of these monoliths on the ground um, that add in additional services that we didn't get before, um, continued distribution of computing power. So, Content services is really starting to adopt that concept of um, where the data resides may not be the important thing. It, it's really about people's expectation of the data and their ability to use it in context of their use case um, in a somewhat real time, taking advantage of, of the, the democratization of, of the distribution of compute power and, and data itself. So, um, with that, Sandy, is ECM really does. Well, it depends who you ask. Um, there are many, this is a hot, hot topic, and it started with Gartner a little, maybe almost a year ago, a little more than a year ago, um, essentially uh, proclaiming that ECM was dead. Um, and it, of course, I've got a lot of people talking and it got uh, a lot of press. And what they are really saying is the, what Julie described, this sort of the notion of one monolithic place where all data lives and all content lives and everyone goes there to search it and use it. That notion is kind of, if it's not dead, it's pretty well dying. And it's being replaced by uh, content services. So we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Um, and by the way, people get confused. When, when the phrase content services is called that, it's not like a service like, I'd like to order some content, please. It's more the notion of data being served up when it's used, when it needs to be used. So that's where that kind of notion comes from. It's very similar to web services. For the more techie folks on the phone, you know what that is. This is trying to piggyback on that concept, calling it content services. So what's basically happening in a content services model is, as Julie said, a decoupling of where data lives and from how it is used. So separating storage from usage. So storage, you have lots of different places where data lives. This is why everybody's always trying to undertake these data mapping exercises. My personal viewpoint is that that might be a lost cause if it's going to take you more than, let's say, a week to data map your environment, then it's out of date before you've finished. So you want to kind of consider uh, kind of content where it lives, either now or whether that's permanent or temporarily. And here's, whoops, sorry, bumped it. Um, a good kind of listing of where content tends to live. Uh, there will be ever more uh, things, uh, just to, to point out the IoT, you know, content might live in your refrigerator. That is not on the list at the moment, but maybe it should be. Um, and then the uses, in other words, who's asking about content? Who needs to look across those various storage mechanisms or data silos to accomplish something, whether it's something as simple as search or something far more complex like analysis. Maybe you're looking to do a pull for litigation, or maybe you're looking to um, satisfy some sort of inquiry. This is where you're going to need to go across the silos for a single use case or a single application. So that's what kind of that separation is. I put the little bow tie up here because it's helpful for people to have that as a visual metaphor. On the, on the one side of the bow tie, you have files where they live, the storage. And on the other side of the bow tie, you have the use cases for that. And then in the center where the knot of the bow tie is, there has to be some sort of intelligence that is both aware of the data, what it says, what it is, how it should be used, and able to serve it up, content services, serve it up on the fly to the applications and use cases that are asking about it. And that's the knot. Here at Valora, obviously, that's Powerhouse, our product. Um, but there are, you know, there are other approaches too, but that's how we tend to look at the world. So if you follow that model through, so this is sort of content services in the abstract. Um, here's what it looks like in a typical organization. You have your various data silos. And by the way, we're getting ever looser about what constitutes data, what constitutes content. Right? But it used to be like, wow, audio and video, that's unusual content. 
that's that's nothing compared to you know yeah it's coming off of your baby monitor you know or or your car uh, those are sources of content as well. So we include things like paper, and eventually I'm going to start including cars and refrigerators here as data silos, data where it lives. Then it, we're sort of doing the bow tie on its side. If you tilt your head, you can kind of sort of see a bow tie coming. Um, so you have your silos, and then you have your use cases, your needs. Most people in records and information governance, maybe e-discovery, recognize themselves down here. These are the requests or the needs, maybe some of you dealing with GDPR see yourself down in here, that need to go across all of those silos to answer the question of what do we have? Is it being held properly? Are we in compliance? What do we need to produce? Again, what's your use case? So you have that notion in the center, that traffic cop, that smart intelligence layer. Um, here at Valora, we use our two products. Julie, do you want to speak to where ECM plays a role in this universe? So I'll just add that, um, again, back to the pragmatism side of this, um, I've ado I adopted that, that vision of information governance years ago that ECM as, a, as an application, a type of application, I think can be quite useful um, in certain parts of an organization um, that has regular ongoing needs for its own data. So like a, a manufacturing company, maybe the R&D group, might benefit from an ECM-ish kind of or document management kind of application for their own day-to-day -day uses. But um, the problem has been in information governance is um, extracting that out to the, in, to the enterprise level. And so that's where content services really, I think, is going to get us to where we need to be. Um, that we're going to stop thinking about things in departmental or other types of swim lanes, and we're going to think about the enterprise and say, all right, department or swim lane, you can do what you need to do as long as we have some way as an enterprise to meet our overall governance needs, and that's where this, content, this, this concept of content services comes in. Which I basically just said, but now here's a different picture. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I love the IDRM model. I use it all the time. So if there's anybody on this call that isn't familiar with it, I really encourage you to go out to the EDRM folks and look at the information governance reference model here. Um, typically, I talk about this model as a stakeholder model to talk about the different parts of an organization who, who has a part to play and, and how well information is governed and the decisions you make around that. Uh, but I thought it was useful here just to also point out that you can also use this model to talk about uh, the technologies that you use and the, the policies and, and frameworks that you employ. So content services, we're still talking about an application layer here. So it is that circle in the middle where we're talking. That's where we actually integrate policy and actually apply policy and generate transparency around the application of those policies. And so... Uh, content services is absolutely not a new name for information governance. It is a strategy to achieve it. Information governance is still that uh, gray circle or line or arrow on the outside of, of the colorful pie that says unified governance. That's really the why. That's what we're trying to achieve and, and how we make our decisions. Um, and then content services is actually the how we go about uh, applying those decisions in a practical sense to the data where it lives in the context of our stakeholders. Actually, I'd like to pick up on something there, which is because there's sure. content services is kind of like the new buzzword and people are slapping it on everything. So as Julie said, it's definitely not a replacement for information governance. IG is a much broader uh, concept than content services. And similarly, content services is not just a modern day ECM or, you know, a buzzword for a technology. It, it's really more of a structure uh, for for as as Julie said, as, as a pragmatic structure for handling the myriad types of data that are out there and the myriad use cases that are requesting it. So content services is is basically like a an infrastructure schema. If you're if you're wondering how to define it or, or where it belongs, it's it's not a tool in itself, and it's not information governance in itself either. It's a technique. Yeah, agreed. All right, so. Um... Moving into the next section, we're going to talk about 
it was kind of the future around information governance, some of the realities at least around that. And so my, my favorite of all time uh, quote from Clay Shirky, it's not information overload, it's filter failure. And I just can't impress upon all of us enough that um, that not only is still spot on, but it's only going to get worse. And so the good news is, is we have technologies that are helping us uh, build smart filters because, you know, if just a filter may not be enough for us. We need them to be smart. Um, and that's where I think content services comes in. It's somewhat of a conceptual filter uh, that helps us deal with all of the stuff that we have in total and boil it down to something that's useful in the context of the use case. Um, but we have other realities, things like uh, the cloud, um, things like data immediacy um, around use cases, but also increasing compliance requirements. And then, um, you know, <laughs> towards the end of this this part of the discussion, I'm going to hand it off to Katie, but um, we have to talk about the increasing relevance of ethics and accountability on data use, data capture, data processing, um, because I think there's some really important, you know, very recent things uh, going on that, that are demonstrating that just, well, I, I'm not going to spoil, I'm not going to spoil, I'll stop there, Sandy, go. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll pick up on the uh, the filter failure uh, quote, which I just love, um, and, and that's exactly right, in, in part because the filters that we've had historically have been very simplistic. Um, they've just been like simple text searches or, you know, date ranges. Those are never going to fly in the kind of world that, frankly, that we're in now, let alone that is coming. This is where auto classification really plays a role because not only is it an intelligent filter, it's a multifaceted filter. So you're filtering on 15, 20, 100 different attributes at any given moment, some of which you may not even realize you're filtering on because the system is doing it for you. We're going to get into, in a minute, machine uh, learning and AI about uh, and, and one of the most promising applications there is that those can turn on filters or create filters without a human having to say, please filter this now. They can anticipate that. And so the the notion of ever smarter filters is very much tied to, that's exactly what auto classification is at the end of the day. It's a combination I really like the word filtering because it's a combination of knowing what something is, which we use uh, a very rich metadata as a proxy, and knowing what to do about it, where we're using rules and disposition as a proxy. So a filter is just a, a fabulous concept because it's combining both those pieces. Once you add the multifaceted and the predictive aspect onto that, we should, quote unquote, we should be able to deal with this data onslaught. So let's go, let's go face it down. <laughs> so this is um, cloud adoption over, um, actually we're in the middle of it. We're in 2018, so the last two years and going forward. And um, this is an 83% growth rate in four years. Uh, this is the stuff that billionaires are made of. <laughs> um, and I'm sure everybody on this call is feeling that. I mean, just to give from my own personal viewpoint, about two years ago, we would get asked about, you know, running powerhouse or, or performing classification in the cloud, maybe one in three. Now I would say there's not a single conversation that goes by that doesn't involve it. Many of those things skip the on-prem, go right to cloud. And that's happened in, in my case in a two-year time frame. So any kind of future looking um, information governance has got to account for the cloud in two ways. One, there's data already living in the cloud, either authorized or unauthorized, people using Box and Dropbox and things, either with permission or without, as well as the kind of massive migration that's happening to Office 365 and Exchange Online, OneDrive, things like that. So data is being stored in the cloud, that's one piece of it, and then processing is transpiring in the cloud. All those cloud services that you're utilizing if you're using a cloud-based e-discovery or if you're using cloud auto classification, the processing is happening there too. And yet there's still data on-prem, there's still processing on-prem. So we kind of have this four-way matrix of worlds that need to talk to each other. Yeah, on-prem has to talk to cloud and that's for processing. And then on-prem has to talk to cloud for data storage and management. So you might have an on-prem solution 
that needs to look at data in the cloud and vice versa. You might have a processing solution in the cloud that looks needs to look at on-prem data. All of those are being kind of worked out a little bit ad hoc with connectors and APIs and things like that, but mostly getting worked out so that there's this seamless transition between on-prem and the cloud, and it kind of doesn't matter. There's that pragmatism, there's that multi-silo again. It doesn't matter where things are or where they're heading. It becomes a seamless world. Yeah, hey, this is Julie, just real quick. I mean, I think maybe at a super macro level, my view of cloud has been particularly accelerated in the last few years. Um, organizations really getting super comfortable with, with storing things in the cloud that they might have said in previous years that I would never store it there. Um, there really is a loosening up of the adoption of that platform for data storage because there are so many inherent benefits around scale and electricity and all that kind of good stuff. And so we're, we're going to continue to see more and more. And then, you know, going back to my favorite topic of the IoT, um, there's stuff that just is always intended to be in the cloud. And so um, it is, it's an important part of the world, but for those of us who are information governance people, uh, that doesn't take away any of the governance. It, it probably complicates it, in fact, because, you know, we are part of a world where there, it, there are sovereign borders and there are different rules and regulations that we have to comply with, particularly if we're multinational organizations or uh, we serve customers in different countries that are subject to different rules. And so um, while all of this is great, cloud adoption is good from a technology standpoint, a services standpoint, uh, it also has a, you know, the other side of that coin can be, can be fairly daunting. What we're heading to is essentially what we would call real-time analysis. Um, a lot of folks in records, information governance, we, we have a tendency, and e-discovery certainly, we have a tendency to look backwards in terms of the data that we have under management, the records that we're responsible for. They, they reflect things that have already occurred. Um, and so now that we're trying to become digital, we're trying to become good data stewards, we're trying to make use of auto classification, we tend to think about that as a batch or a backfile type of endeavor where we like, let's get the 20 years of accumulated stuff you know, under, under control and then we'll move forward. Well, that is starting to happen. And what, what's really happening is with the use of technologies like auto classification and, and machine learning other techniques, there really isn't a need for delay. Um, there isn't really a reason that you have to batch things up and wait for things to accumulate just to deal with them. You're dealing with them in real time. They're kind of event driven. So an email arrives, boom, in the inbox, and it's being assessed right then and there. Um, you know, a, a, uh, let's say, a, uh, you're you're acquiring a company or something. The data arrives, boom! It's being analyzed like right at the moment. So we're starting to see things like SLAs. If people aren't familiar with that, usually stands for service level agreement, um, which is not technically how it's used. SLA usually means like um, performance metrics uh, that people are responsible for. So we're starting to see SLAs or performance metrics around how quickly. Can you understand what this data is and handle it accordingly? GDPR has elements of that. You have to be able to respond to a data subject access request within 30 days. That's an SLA. We don't generally talk about it like that, but that's exactly what it is. There's a ticking clock on the accomplishment of analyzing data. So that's what we mean by real time. Um, they're starting to be associated with that, not just thou shalt comply with these SLAs, but there are penalties and accountability for not doing so. And so we're starting to have this notion of accountability. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in terms of ethics. So I'm not going to get into that too much um, on this slide. And then finally, this notion of persistent data analysis. So not only is it possible to know what your content is, and not only is it possible in real time, it's possible forever on an ongoing basis. So the legislation and the business transactions and the you know kind of Wall Street expectations about data management assume persistent analysis. It's not a one-time thing. 
It's not just getting that old archive, you know, into shape. It's a perpetual analysis that can be called upon at any moment for any purpose. That's what the future is. Frankly, GDPR comes out in, what do we say, nine days? So that future is pretty well now. Just to uh, kind of show that, anybody else getting a million of these kind of emails um, from every possible provider you've ever touched through your entire life? Updates to our privacy, updates to GDPR. I just picked one at random out of my email um, just to give you a feel. But you're going to be seeing a lot of this as people look to head off the potential uh, ramifications and downsides of not being in compliance. Yeah, I'm getting a ton of those too. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things, just to draw out really quick, um, you were talking about persistent analysis. That's, the, you know, for me, that's been my unicorn. My unicorn um, as a as a records manager. Um, it always frustrated me that, you know, we typically got to apply our craft at the end of the life cycle or at least close to the end. Um, and so, but the real value in, in trying to leverage the benefit or the potential upside of an information asset is actually in identifying what that potential is at the point it's created or received. Um, and so moving closer and closer to that point uh, is what I've been working on in my professional career. And um, you know, why, why I like working with folks like Sandy, who are smart and thinking about things like this, too, um, to get us there, because it really is the promise. If the promise of, of information governance is, um, you know, our, our organizations are healthy organizations, and uh, that may mean, you know, maybe I work for the American Cancer Society, and so then that helps me save lives, or maybe, uh, you know, I work for a government organization, and it helps, it helps um you know, root out or uh, inhibit um, corruption. Th those are all really noble causes. And so um, I'm super excited that we're, you know, from a technology standpoint, finally at a point where I, I think we're, we're close. But so that, <laughs> so that takes us to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, uh, this weighs really heavily on my mind um, in this profession a lot because it, uh, you know, just look at Cambridge Analytica, right? It's a, a really recent example of the data is there and I can get access to it and I can do stuff with it. And um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so, um, you know, as a, as a certified professional in a couple of different ways, I'm bound by codes of ethics and uh, I take those very seriously. And um, it just means that we have to be thinking more and more about this, particularly as uh, the transparency around the potential upsides of information use and reuse, and I think reuse is probably where this comes into play more, um, may have really uh, significant ethical implications that we have to help our organizations uh, monitor and work through. Um, you know, there are some obvious ones around like um, intended use. Uh, that's been around you know, HIPAA, all that kind of stuff, GDPR, obviously. Um, but it's not just around that. It's, it's, there's just kind of a more of a moral question that we should be asking ourselves, um, which I'll come back to at, at the, the end of the next session. Anything else you want to add here, um, Sandy? No. Uh, I think we should go right into kind of, you know, all right, here we go. <laughs> Okay, so everybody's favorite topic, AI. Um, so uh, before I, we go any further on this topic, uh, Sandy is going to treat us to uh, a definition of artificial intelligence and machine, machine learning because uh, they're not the same thing. Um, and at least we're going to level set for the, for the purposes of this webinar. Um, so Sandy, take it away. Sure. So just like content services and information governance should not just be slapped on everything, um, same with AI and machine learning. Those tend to get slapped on everything. And, you know, it's like there's a computer involved, so it must be machine learning. You know, OK, kind of. But let's let me give you the official definitions. First of all, AI is the broader topic. It is the study of allowing machines, allowing software to kind of emulate human behavior or act smart, quote unquote. Um, machine learning is a subset of AI, and it is a much more specific things where we're essentially 
teaching or training or enabling software uh, to kind of draw inferences. It's usually based on probability and statistics and say, well, gee, every time I ate a red lollipop, I was happy. So I'm going to use that analysis to say, if I get a red lollipop tomorrow, I will be happy again. That's really what kind of machine learning is. It's analyzing historical data and making forecasts, essentially predictive analytics. That's machine learning. Um, for those who you know who've been through the whole session, you've been watching auto classification, you've been learning about Valora and Epic. That is very much what we utilize here: machine learning technique. Um, it, just so we're clear, it's not machines growing brains. It's not machines, you know, kind of reanimating in the middle of the night. It is specific programmatic algorithms. Okay, so I know sometimes people flip out about these topics. In my personal opinion, there really is not a need to do so. We are creating this software and we, if we're ethical to Julie's point, we are making sure that it doesn't run amok. So at the end of the day, it is algorithms, statistics, it's all that fun math stuff that we all just love, love, love. Um, here are common examples of machine learning that you know, that you have seen. You may not realize that they're machine learning, but that's exactly what's going on. Personally, I drive a Tesla, and so I will, I'll speak to the self-driving car, uh, where basically, what, how does it do that? It is looking at the lines in the road, the double yellow line on the left, the white line on the right, and pushing itself in between a safe distance on the sides of the lines. That is, in essence, how it works. And so if you've ever taken a Tesla on like a dirt road or whatever, it's completely lost. It cannot do that because it hasn't learned what to do in a scenario like that and doesn't have its guidelines. So just to give you examples of machine learning, here they are, lots and lots of good reading. If you're just starting out, I highly recommend this article. Um, I didn't write the whole big thing, but if you just serve on, search on Forbes 12.6, machine learning versus AI, this article will come up. It's an excellent primer. So then that takes us to um, essentially the Venn diagram that says, take me from the broadest possible level AI all the way down to the deepest level. You may have heard about neural networks. That's what's in deep learning. This is pretty much still in the uh, kind of like university academic environment. We're not really yet seeing a whole lot of neural network application, a little bit in healthcare, um, not so much in you know information governance and records just yet, but I promise you when the day comes, I will let you know. <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, I don't know if I, I am as confident that it's not out there. I think uh, deep learning neural networks are closer than we think, um, but I'll save that for the last slide. So, uh, <laughs> between now and then, I'm going to talk about context and quality because there, there are two things that uh, are absolutely required if we're going to extract anything useful out of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So. Context first, and this is, you know, another nod to why the incremental uh, innovations around auto classification are so absolutely important to our ability as a society to capture the value um, and potential of, of, of machines. Um, if we don't understand the context of a piece of information, we can't actually use it for anything. And so context, um, obviously, is the who, what, why, when, how, where. Uh, all those good pieces, and so a lot of a lot of data is not naturally um, generated with those things all clearly spelled out. And so we need technology to help us uncover context and apply context, um, so then our machines can do smart things. Um, so that's context. But then there's quality, and so this is one of my favorite Bill, Ga Bill Gates quotes. I use it a lot. Um, the first rule of any technology used in a business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. The second is that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. And so um, quality systems and quality data are absolutely important. AI is, is just a form of automation. Um, and so these, these rules of thumb apply. And uh, I'm doing a lot of work right, right now within Epic on our own, um, our own capabilities and really examining the underlying business processes that support the data that we're using for various different purposes. Um, and so it's really getting down into the details. And this is all good work that uh, records managers and information governance, information um, professionals in general can, can be doing. Um, 
and bringing these principles to bear. I mean, these are, these are kind of principle level things that I stand on in my meetings with clients and colleagues. Um, if we don't, if we aren't going to spend the time to get the process right, uh, then no amount of automation is going to actually deliver a good result for us. So what we're having here now as, as we're sort of on this cusp of, of just in, sort of information explosion and yet having the tools to still deal with it um, is starting to think about, I already talked about real time, so I won't spend much time on that, but also looking, using the same types of technologies, auto classification, machine learning, things like that, to predict future issues or future outcomes. So for example, let's say you're already looking through, uh, you know, 300 terabytes of email to, you know, determine rot or to determine retention or something else. Why not at the same time look at that for potential issues? Wow, there's a harassment issue here, or this is, you know, a, a dialogue that should not be taking place. It's it's relatively easy to preempt those kind of what will ultimately become big explosions or big issues later by being just the tiniest bit proactive as long as you're analyzing the data anyway. So this is kind of the world that we're heading to with this notion of persistent data analysis. We should be able to head off or at least identify issues as they are brewing. So that's one of the big promises that machine learning and AI bring to us is to be able to see a little bit ahead. I'll give again a case in point, my car, um, it was able to see through a van in front of me to know that there was a bicyclist in front of that van. I could not see it, but it was on my screen and it's little outline saying, I can see what you can't, it comes up red. So that I knew there was a bicyclist there, even though there was no possible way to see it through the van that was in front of me. That's a great example of essentially predicting future behavior, pre preempting crises by being able to anticipate them. So this is some of the, the fun stuff that we're doing. Um, a lot of triangulating of data is needed to do this. And so, Julie, I'll let you speak to some of yours. Yeah, so this is, um, <laughs> so my husband recently, a couple of years ago, decided to leave the corporate world and start his own business. And, and so that his interim job was driving Uber and Lyft. Um, so this is actually a heat map from Uber that they use to help support uh, surge pricing. Um, and even out to ban. So uh, again, this is using um, AI machine learning to help um, help Uber manage its fleet as effectively. And the next one's my favorite. You click another again, Sandy. So this, I don't know if any of you have been part of this, um, but <laughs> Gmail in the app can actually now um, automatically suggest replies to email, and they're getting pretty scary good. Like they're starting to learn. Um, the way you talk about things, the way the words you use and your phraseology. Um, so when it first started, it was pretty generic, like, sounds good, thanks, love it. Um, but now it's really starting to kind of dig into the things that you write and the way that you talk. So uh, again, that's machine learning. So anytime you click on one of those, you know, canned responses that says, you know, does this fit? And that's going to tell Google that that was a good fit. And so it's going to rank it higher. I'm going to continue to use that as, as part of your, you know, effectively feed set if you want to use that word. If you want to click one more time, Sandy, because we're coming up pretty close on that. And so this is just a super cool thing. Um, this is called ShotSpotter. Uh, it's deployed in, in major cities mostly, um, and not all of them. But uh, what this is is actually using sound to triangulate location related to gunshots, um, because only about 20% of gunshots are actually called into law enforcement. Um, this system will just be listening for it anyway. Um, but I'll come back to the fact that it's listening because, um, you know, I don't own a, a what Echo or whatever those things are called because I don't like things listening to me all the time. But the point is you may not know it. <laughs> so, um, all right, next slide, Sandy, real quick. All right, so we, we wanted to just kind of, um, we've, got, we've got two more, and then we actually have some polls of people hang out for a minute that we'd like to ask you. Uh, but basically, um, to, to go from kind of the hype into best practice, one is we want to make sure that you're inoculated against the crazy hype and, you know, AI is going to do, change everything and whatever. Yes, to a degree, um, 
but there are tools that are keeping pace with that as there always are. Um, one thing I would point out is to recognize that there are intentional bad actors out there. I would put Cambridge Analytica in that category. Um, and so machine learning really does need to be supervised. You can't just sort of say, all right, machine, go, go learn. Good luck with that. The same way, almost like you wouldn't with a child. You have to give it guidance and parameters and check in on what it's doing. So get ready, folks, in, in information governance. That's going to be your role. Um, so on the one hand, we'd suggest that you look for technologies that are adaptive, that will evolve, like I was saying, be able to connect to other situations that have automatic ways of enhancing themselves, but that also maintain sensible controls. You don't want to just, you know, enhance willy nilly. You have to have control. And one of the big things, be able to revert back to what you had last time in case something's gone wrong. So these are some of the things that, you know, we would sort of advise you with. Um, and for our last kind of, uh, uh, go ahead, Julie. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the negative Nancy today. I apologize for that, but it's so scary. Um, all right, so uh, harnessing the power without destroying ourselves. So this is um, the Spider-Man quote, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, this quote here is from uh, an article uh, from the ACLU. So, uh, you know, this this is really an important this topic and issue for me, but the quote here is, without democratic participation, um, we have no way to ensure that artificial intelligence isn't exacerbating inequality and obstructing human agency, possibly without our ever knowing. So you think about those sensors that are listening and watching everything that we do in cities in order to preempt a disaster or, uh, you know, zero in on a uh, some sort of um, risky something that's happening right now. Uh, realize that it's, it's listening all the time. And so if we aren't aware that that's just there uh, as individual citizens, we can't actually uh, object to that. Um, and then if you click, and then of course the killer robots, because as much as Danny likes to say that uh, there are, you know, are ways to control our machines from learning from their learning, we're actually training our machines now to learn from their learning. So um, this is a possibility. And so we do rely on, on human beings and our moral and ethical code to keep ourselves in check. Um, and I think that records managers and information governance professionals are at the front line of that. So uh, good work ahead of us, folks. Um, this has been a super pleasure. Sandy, we're right up at the time, so I don't know if we're going to have time to do any um, specific Q&A. So I'm going to wrap it up real quick for us. Um, we're available. You can find us anywhere uh, on our website. Uh, our email, I'm sure, is readily available on the Internet as well. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. We are going to be sending a follow-up email to all registered um, folks with uh, links to all the other sessions, copies of the slides. Um, we'd love your feedback. So um, if anybody has any questions or comments, please do reach out. Sandy and I would uh, love to chat with you about any of these topics or anything else that's on your mind. And I want to thank Sandy for um, her partnership. This has just been a blast. Thank you. And thank you too, Jolie. It was it was great working with you on this. Um, I've got a poll running right this second. If you guys can't get enough Sandy, Julie, uh, we might do an Ask Us Anything kind of free form raw webinar. Um, it looks like from the responses that people really want to see that, Julie. So uh, we'll probably run that over the summer. So stay tuned and we'll we'll do that. Sounds good. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, really appreciate it. And we'll see you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.